Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is John Hammond, and in this video, I want to showcase this Baby Boy Challenge from Seesaw CTF 2019. This was the first challenge in the Pwn category, or Binary Exploitation, and it's, uh, I guess, trivial, right, in that it's a low 50-point challenge in the Binary Exploitation category. Um, but this is not really my strong suit, and I learned something really cool in this challenge that I wasn't aware of before, so I wanted to share it with you. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. It gives us a couple files to download here. It says, welcome to Pwn as the description, and we're given a netcat command that we could use to connect to the service. So it has to work remotely, right? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a little connect.sh script just so we can save that and connect to it as we needed to. So I just created a simple bash script and copied it in there so we'd be able to actually run that command and don't have to worry about, oh, here is my... Uh, actual netcat host and port number, etc. Just a convenience thing that I like to do. It says, hello, here I am, and gives me some hex value here. So, hello, okay, and that's it. That's all the binary seems to do, but we can go find out what it really does because they give us the binary, a libc, like the C library, shared object file, and the babyboy.c source code. So let's download all these. I'm just going to right click and hit wget or copy location so we can throw that to wget and we'll download it and let's work through all of these. So wget that, do the exact same thing. Cool. So now we have these files here. We have the libc, we have the source code, and I had downloaded it previously. My bad. Okay, now we're clean. <laughs> let's see what this is. This is a 64-bit executable, so we know we're working with 64-bit architecture, uh, x86-64, and not stripped binaries, so if you wanted to, you could do things like read elf on all of that and see what we have in here. Nothing particularly interesting, uh, but we don't need to do all that because we have the source code. So let's take a look at babyboy.c. And this is our source code. It looks like we're just including regular standard libraries for C. We have a simple main function with arguments that just uh, flushes the buffer here or works with standard out, standard in, standard error. That works just fine for us. And we have a buffer variable, 32 bytes, and it's just saying, hello, here I am with the value of printf. So we actually get to see one location of a C standard library function and know where it actually is in that binary's runtime. That's going to be pretty handy for us because it looks like the next line is a gets function call. So gets is just that, hey, super dangerous function, never actually use this. If we check with the man page for gets, it says this will read in a string from standard input, but it's deprecated. It doesn't check for any buffer overflows. It doesn't verify whether or not it actually is within the bounds of the buffer that you pass to it, that variable that's created there. So it tells us up here, hey, never use gets. It's impossible to tell the data in advance before how many actually characters we're reading in. So we could very well be subject to a buffer overflow attack. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we know that that is the shape of the binary. That's what we're working with. Uh, I'm going to clear out all of these things in my Sublime Tech, so that's kind of clean for us. And now let's go ahead and start to beat up this binary. I'm using Pwn tools, so I've got Pwn Cyclic that I can actually use, and we'll actually be able to use that to fuzz data or actually send a cyclic pattern to it. Uh, we know that it is about 32, just pulling up the source code here, we know that it is 32 characters for a buffer, so we could send more than that. Let's send like 50 just to send it to our baby boy here. And I need to mark that as executable. So don't forget that. chmod plus x, baby boy. And now, if you wanted to pwn cyclic, let's just send some data to it. Uh, when I'm using pwn cyclic, what that's doing is just actually creating a cyclic string. So we'd be able to tell, okay, if we're looking at D message where our instruction pointer crashes or overflows, we could see that. We know we're getting that segmentation fault. So we can see that just easily. Let's check out D message, see where I'm at. And I'm getting a general protection, seeing a trap there. That doesn't really help me. So I know, okay, let's tone that down. Let's go to about like 45 and throw that at our baby boy binary. Check out D message one more time. That's probably pretty hard to see. Sorry, my face might be in the way. But okay, now we see we're overriding 6C, 6 61, 61, 61, 61, 61, 61B. Um, is that actually what we are overwriting though? Let's I'm gonna I'm just gonna tweak this lower and lower. We'll get to 40. 
I'll check D message. Now I get a seg fault at zero. Okay, so seg fault at zero means that I probably just clobbered the instruction pointer, 64 bits, so we're RIP rather than EIP. And maybe there's just a null byte in there. Let's flood that again with 41 and see if we get potentially our last character, maybe an A in there, maybe something, lowercase a. So let's check our D message output and still zero. We're not fully clobbering it. We're just trying to massage this input so we can find our offset is or where we can clobber that instruction pointer because we know that's going to be overflowed. And there's our 6, 1 and 6, B in there. Okay, so that's two. So we can assume that 40 is going to end up being our offset and we can start to build out an exploit or payload to actually work with this. We don't have any functions that we could jump to, like a simple like get flag or print flags or get shell. So we need to be able to probably track down the system function call within libc and then go ahead and uh, actually call that function and we'll just get a shell. We'll run bin sh and it'll, and it'll work for us. So let's check it out. Let's go ahead and create a script. I'll call mine ape.py get a shebang line rolling for us. And I'm going to be using pwn tools. So from pwn import everything. And let's grab our binary here. Let's create an elf object for baby boy. And I'm actually going to want to differentiate between I'm running this locally and running this remotely because we have our connect script. And that is the host name and port number here. So let's say port can equal that, host can equal that. And let's set like a variable, just a Boolean test for us, local equals true or not, whether or not we're actually going to run this locally or remotely. So I'll say if local, then my P will equal elf.process. Probably that sounds weird to say, sorry. My, I'm going to create a process from this binary, and I'm just going to call that variable P because that's shorthand, really easy, really simple. If we were remote, or if we were not actually using a true value of local, we'll use these host and port values, and let's set p to a remote session of host and port. So now we're gonna, we know we're going to connect to it. And let's go ahead and print, sorry, let's print out p.receive, so we can see what we're working with here. And I'm going to use this in Python 2 before it dies and goes away. <laughs> 2020 is coming quick. Note if we were to use Python 3, we return the same information. I'm using the Python 3 uh, pwn tools that you can find on GitHub. I think the project isn't maintained anymore, but it's still usable. We use it for Katana and other projects. Uh, so B notes that, okay, we're receiving this information as bytes. And it's actually a little problematic in the way you might normally use pwn tools, especially if you're working with a binary and trying to work with some uh, libc libraries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It gives us a nice check stack output, so we can see we don't have to work with PIE, we don't have to worry about a stack canary or anything, but we know we're working on a 64-bit executable, and we cannot execute off the stack, so we can't use shellcode. We have to use something like ROP or the return-oriented programming language stuff to really abuse this binary. Okay, it's giving us the system location, I said system and that was the wrong word, it's giving us the location of the printf function in C, in our libc library, and we can see that, okay, that is going to change every single time because of ASLR, maybe on the remote system or even on my local system. Uh, let's run this with Python 2, sorry. But since we can know that value even at runtime because the program will tell us, then we could potentially determine where the base address of libc is. We could just go ahead and work with it. We could just actually subtract out, we know the location of printf, so now we could find the base address of libc, and because we're given the libc file, we know where system is. So simple ret2 libc attack because they simply just give us printf. Let's go ahead and work with that. Uh, I'm going to load just a... Uh, LDD, I'm going to use LDD to find out where my local computer is actually using my libc rendition. Looks like it's in forward slash lib x86, blah, blah, blah. So let's say libc can equal elf of that. And if we were remotely, we would use the libc from that libc that's in our current directory, right? Our libc 2.27.so, whatever. So let's just slap that in there. Okay, so now that we have libc, 
let's carve out where we're receiving that uh, print F location, and let's go ahead and use that to find our libc base address. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, p dot receive until, and let's get until the here I am kind of syntax there. Here I am with a space, and let's do p receive, just following that, and I'll say that that is uh, stripped, so we don't get that new line character there. Let's print that, and now let's run our script. Still working locally. Now we can see, hey, we've got our printf uh, address here just displayed as that variable. Let's go ahead and actually make that a number because right now that's a string. So I'm going to use the int function to wrap around that, and I'm just going to say that's base 16. That should be inside of my int function. Sorry. So we don't need to print that anymore, but let's actually call that printf. Now if I were to print printf, Python treats it as an integer just in decimal. If you wanted to see that in hex, now we just encapsulate that variable and it's a number that we can work with. So perfect. Now that we know where libc is, now that we know the printf is in libc at runtime, we can find out the base address of libc. So let's check that out. Let's say libc, which is this object we created in Pwn Tools, we can actually use libc.address and say this is where the base address of libc is going to be. You have to set this when you're working with that libc object from Pwn Tools. By default, it's zero. So all the offsets between symbols and things in the GOT or the PLT are just based off of zero within the file as it knows. But you can set it to something else corresponding to the libc file you're working with. And then all of the other offsets, excuse me, all the other offsets or the symbols you want to pull will just be the correct value. So let's see that. We can say libc address can equal printf, because we just got that value, minus where we see the libc symbols address of printf, indexing just like that. Okay, so with that syntax, just a little math, just some quick subtraction there, we can find out the base address and the offset there. I'm going to print that out. I'm going to print out libc.address, and I'll put that in hex so we can see it. And let me just add a few uh, display things here so we know what we're talking about when I show this on the screen. Cool. Printf, we know is at all of this. In libc base address, now that we've done that math, we know is at all of this. And that looks like it's paginated well. That's in the right uh, kind of area in memory. We can That makes sense to us because this starts off the same way. So now we've got base of libc. And that means, now that we've kind of corrected our libc rendition, we know where system is as well. Uh, let me show you something just real quick. If I were to run that same script, doing that same thing with Python 3, using the Python 3 Pwn tools, this is the issue that I was going to run into, and I wanted to inform you about it, is that when you try and retrieve that printf out of the symbols here, it'll tell you, hey, Kier, I don't know what you're really talking about, because you have to index that with bytes. And that's a stupid idiosyncrasy that you might trip on and run into. I don't want you to have to end up falling on that. Now, if I had that B prefix to say that's in bytes, sure, it'll be able to find it and run without an error. So let's uh, still use Python 2 when I run it. And that works just fine for us. Okay. So now we have our libc address, our printf address, and now we can say the real system is at libc symbols of system. Perfect. So now we could call system if we were to overwrite our instruction pointer, that RIP value. But we're not using regular 32-bit calling conventions. Now we're in 64-bit. So if we actually want to pass an argument to system, which we do, right, we want to actually run it with uh, a value loaded into RDI. So those are the 64-bit calling conventions. It looks for arguments in RDI, and then I think RSI, and other locations. Uh, then it gets into the R1 stuff. I can't remember off the top of my head, but RDI is the first argument that we're going to need. So we need to find a gadget or some location in the binary or within libc that we could actually return and work with that pop RDI instruction, so we can suddenly fill a value inside of our 
argument and give that to our system function here. So let's do that. I'm going to actually use ROP gadget. And when you use ROP gadget, you need to use tac tac binary. You can see Z shell is trying to autocomplete for me stuff that I've already done here. So let's just give it the baby boy binary because maybe we could find stuff in there that we need rather than looking in libc. And we have a lot of results here. Kind of hard to see on the screen, sorry. But one of these real quick for us is this pop RDI and ret. So pop RDI and return. Everything will have a return at the end of it because we are using ROP, return oriented programming. So that way we can just jump to this position, move back to where we were, and that's how ROP works. It's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and take that address and let's just say pop RDI can equal that. And let's start to build a build out, sorry, excuse me, a potential ROP chain. Let's say we want to pop RDI, but what do we want to pop into RDI? What value do we need to give in there? Well, we need to give it that bin sh string, but where are we going to find that? We can find it within the binary. What we can do is actually use libc, because that's given to us. We can use search, and we're just looking for a string here. So we can just pass in bin sh. When you do this, you'll note that that's actually going to give you an iterator or a generator object. So if you want to get the first result, uh, I just run dot next. And now we have that address. If we were to check that out in hex. Cool. Now we have a location within the libc where bin sh, just that string exists. And we could give that to system because we popped it into that RDI register and we'll use that as an argument in 64-bit calling conventions. So let's say that that value is our bin sh string, or variable that we want to use here. Now we've got a ROP chain. We can use ROP chain, pop RDI, bin sh, and let's go ahead and call system with that. I like to use this syntax. Uh, I found it, or at least kind of like that idea. Um, Caleb, my roommate, uses it a lot, especially uh, he's Illicit Tiger in the Discord server, and you've probably seen him in other videos. This is a really cool technique that he uses, and he's much better at binary exploitation than I am. If you create a ROP chain just like that inside of a list, you kind of read it in a more assembly-like fashion, and then we can just join it together by using P64 or P32 on all of those, and that way it's in that little endian format that we need to be able to pass to our binary. So I'll just say R for R in ROP chain. So now we have a ROP chain that we could use. And we need our payload, which we'll just say a random junk, random stuff, 40 times, because that'll fill up until we get to our return instruction pointer. I'm sorry, our uh, RIP, our 64-bit uh, instruction pointer. Now that we've hit that offset, now that we are flooding into the instruction pointer, we'll pop in our ROP chain. That will call pop RDI with bin sh and then jump to system. So let's try that. Let's go ahead and use p dot send our payload. I think send line is what we want. Let's find out. And now that we've sent that, we should theoretically jump to a shell or call a shell. So let's move that into interactive so we can see it work. There we go. And switching to interactive mode, I'll hit enter a few times, and I'll run ID. And now you can see that's John. So I can run who am I? I'm still John. And we have a shell. I can run commands. So we just called bin sh, and now we have control over that system. I'm running this locally, though. So all we have to do now, because we've set up, hey, here's our host and port, here's the remote service that we're connecting to, and using the remote libc, we can just switch that to false up top here, and we can go ahead and run our script, and we should be able to work with it. But we got an end of file while reading an interactive mode. I don't have a shell. So this is what I struggled with for a little bit of time. Caleb and I were wrestling with it. Uh, it sounded like people, even on the Discord server and those that were playing CSAW CTF, were wrestling with this. Uh, I did not know this. This was a whole new thing that I got to learn, and props and shout out and thank you to Crypto, uh, was his name in Discord, who uh, reached out to me and checked in with me and said, like, hey, uh, I got this, do you need a hand, what's up? Because um, my, my exploit, I said, like, I don't, I don't know what's going on, my exploit works locally, it does not work remotely, what do I do? 
there's no way to research that kind of thing. <laughs> like I couldn't, I couldn't track it down. So the guy said to me, the remote service is on Ubuntu 1804 and I'm running on 1604 locally. Um, and apparently Ubuntu 1804 in its 64 bit sense, I don't know if it's strictly Ubuntu 1804, maybe, maybe other 64 bit distributions or things do this, but, uh, apparently it works memory, the stack, the whole, this whole binary realm, uh, works in a 16 byte boundary. So that means that our payload and things need to be aligned or within a, uh, kind of 16 byte multiple. So what we have here for our ROP chain, pop RDI, we know that's eight bytes or, and same with Binus H and all. That gave us 16 total here, but system that's not. So right now our stack pointer is not being fully aligned to that 16 byte boundary. And we're not able to call system on the remote machine. So what we could do is just fill that with a little bit of garbage or some padding, just some junk with eight bytes somewhere, really just not in our pop RDI alignment there because we need that to fill that argument uh, and not after system because we need that filled out before we're calling system. Our stack pointer needs to be set and aligned within that boundary before we end up calling the function. So we could put it just before system or put it at the front here. Uh, let's do it just before system. And we need just padding and junk. Uh, a good way to do that is just check our ROPs one more time or our gadgets here. Uh, we have one of these that is just a simple ret command there. So let me take that and let's just create a variable for that. Let's say ret can equal that value there. And we have everything else that we need to build out our ROP chain. And let's say ret right before we call system. Okay, so we have some information, some testing to set up, whether or not we're running this locally or remotely. Uh, maybe it would be a cool idea to do this with arg parse so we don't have to just be modifying our script while we're working with it. Uh, we determined the address of libc so we could get the proper system location. We got a couple gadgets between popRDI and ret and we found where bin sh is in our libc. And now we built out a rob chain with P64, put it in the little Indian format that we need, use the correct offset and we're sending it and we're going interactive. So now let's see if I run this working remotely, local is false, will we get a shell? It doesn't kick me out. Whack enter a few times. Looks like we're still in ID. We're baby boy. All right, LS, we got it. Now we have a shell on that remote service, on that remote system, and we did it. Cat flag. There it is. Flag, baby boy. <laughs> do, 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 do. All right. Let me clear that up so it's more at the top of the screen for us. And that is that. So you can go ahead and submit that. A 50 point challenge. Still some hefty stuff. Um, I by no means am good at binary exploitation. This was a learning experience for me. Uh, I need to practice a lot more with this ROP Emporium, maybe Ponable.xyz, other resources and war games that I need to work through so that I can get better and we can get better. You can get better too when it's, that's the community, that's the family. But right now I need to focus on OSCP. So <laughs> thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please do like, comment, and subscribe. I would love to see you guys in the Discord server. There is a link in the description. If you are willing to support the channel, which I am always so grateful for and so thankful for, I have a Patreon account, also link in the description. Would love to see you on there. Super duper grateful and super thankful for all that you do to support. So thank you guys. I'll see you in the next video.